How do you do, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another edition of Cup Show. Tonight's show is going to run 90 minutes instead of our usual hour because we have some very special people we want you to meet. First, you'll meet Jackie Gleason, the great one himself, who's starring at the, in the Sly Fox at the, era, at the Blackstone Theater. And then you'll meet the three gentlemen in the more serious vein, Carl Sagan, the great Pulitzer Prize winning astronomer who's written The Dragons of Eden, Tom Wicker of the New York Times who's written a book called On the Press, and Ben Wattenberg, a political analyst who has a show on the public broadcasting system called In Search of Real America. So you can see we're going to get into a lot of different areas, but first, away we go with Jackie Gleason. Ladies and gentlemen, we're proud to present the great one himself, a man of many, many talents, raconteur, comedian, actor, musical composer, a renaissance man who plays a leading role in Sly Fox at the theater. Jackie, welcome once again. It's been a long Thank time you, since we've had a chance to talk on television. Yes. And I'm delighted that you're looking so good and dressed so casually. This is your favorite form of dress when you're casual, isn't it? Yes. yes. I noticed that the press interview... If somebody yesterday. asked me if I jogged. I don't. I jug. <laughs> but uh, I like this kind of an outfit. I'm sick. Of, I do five fast changes in the second act in the show, so I'm tired of putting on clothes. I don't blame you. Jackie, you're talking about Jug. Uh, you're famous for that little cup you use on your most of your appearances. How did that come about? Well, I did a show called You're in the Picture. I think you remember. It was the biggest bomb that ever took place. Bigger than Skidoo? Oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, God, there's another beauty. <laughs> uh, but uh, I demanded uh, from CBS permission to go on the following week and tell the audience how dreadful this thing was. And strangely enough, they gave me the permission. And just before the show, I realized that going out in front of an audience and talking about a bomb for an hour uh, would sound like sour grapes. So I told the girl, I said, just before the show starts, walk out with a bottle of J&B and make sure the audience knows that it's J&B and pour it into my cup. And I knew that every time I reached for that cup, I would, uh, the audience would understand what was in it. And it would break up the fact that I, I was uh, saying how stupid we were to do the show. And that's how the cup started, mm -hmm. and I've used it ever since. If I recall that explanation or that apology you sat at a little table didn't you i just sat in a chair, a chair with a table alongside with the cup yeah on. we got uh, great reviews for that yeah. and then we continued to do the show i still did that and we did it for uh, i think 13 14 weeks and we got uh, good notices we had good ratings and i had to go to paris to do Gigo, and i left it i'd love to do a show like that again just sit there and converse Just sit with the there audience. And gab and you and, uh, cover a lot of areas, Jackie. Ask Jackie, the audience uh, if they want. You mentioned reviews a second ago, and you got good reviews for that apology. And now you open Thursday night in the Sly Fox. Friday morning's paper carried two reviews. It's difficult how expert reviewers, as we have in Chicago, came out with such divergent opinions. Glenna Sice of the Chicago Sun-Times loved it. It was, how sweet it is, was the headline. Yeah. And Linda Weiner of the Tribune was uh, far less uh, sanguine well, about the uh, show. Well, an wasn't interesting crazy. thing about Linda Weiner's uh, review is that she uh, reviewed my shoes. Oh, yes. Yes, that's right. And that's the first time I've ever been in a show where my shoes were reviewed. And I think that that... Uh, make some commentary on a review when they look at an actor's shoes. And incidentally, she was wrong because the shoes I'm wearing, she claimed were uh, suitable for a country club in Florida. They happen to be the exact replicas of slippers with the little elastic mm -hmm. instead of the laces of uh, 1880 shoes. So she was wrong on that. But of course, she's entitled to her opinion. If she didn't like the show, fine. And she opens up with a very uh, dichotomous uh, statement. She says, uh, the baffling hilarity. Well, I don't understand that. I'm supposed to make people hilarious if I yeah. can. And why should that be baffling? I would assume without reading Linda's mind that to her, she couldn't understand why it was hilarious. To her, it was baffling that the people were found it funny. Well, I, I, was in I the should audience think that a woman who reviews shows over the years uh, would be able to make a judgment when she hears people laughing. The very I fact that people are laughing is... Uh, yeah, but it was baffling to, to be her. reported in itself. I enjoyed the show very much, Jack. I guess at one point I want to continue with the Linda Weiner report. 
Uh, she makes remarks about the low-grade humor, some of the sexual well, humor. Well, uh, you know, six she ought to the... hype up her grammar. If she's going to talk about low-grade humor, I'll talk about low-grade grammar. She starts off her column by saying Sly Fox Witch is appearing at uh, the Blackstone Theater, which is an incongruous grammatical mistake. And I'm surprised a woman who is supposed to be scholarly would use such kind of uh, words. Uh, she made some remarks about the number of references to the penis and the uh, low-grade jokes, the uh, low-grade humor used in the show. Now, you have always been a man who's exemplified clean humor. Everything you've done has been uh, away from sex, away from the four-letter dirty words and so forth. Did you have any reservations about doing this type of humor uh, in the show? To begin with, I don't use any four-letter no, words in the but show. but the implication is that. And second of all, uh, you're right. I do have the distinction of appearing on particular media where I know that you're not supposed to say certain words or to act salacious. I wouldn't do some of the television shows that are on now. I'd never do those things. But that's television. We are now in a theater where you're charging $17 yes. or something to get in. So you imagine that no kids are going to show up for 17 bucks. And if they do show up, it should be with parental guidance. We have in our ads, it's a bawdy, racy yeah. thing. And uh, what people accept in the theater today is an entirely different thing what they accepted mm -hmm. years ago. Uh, what we do in the show, uh, I would rather say something shocking or say a four-letter word and get a laugh than to say a four-letter word just to impugn on an audience uh, something shocking to make it vivid, a line vivid that you say. That's bad. But if you make people laugh, that's my business. That's what I'm supposed to do. And that's why I can't understand her gorgeous line, baffling hilarity. I didn't see anything baffling about the hilarity because I thought it was hilarious, I? Yeah, hilarious, hilarious, as I should say. And the audience certainly laughed. There were a lot of laughs in there. Well, I, th I think we're giving too much time to her review, but I will say this. As I said before, she's entitled to her own opinion, uh, but if she's going to be scholarly, she better start studying grammar. And if she's going to quote what is on uh, Johnson's epitaph, she better quote it correctly. And uh, what I don't Johnson? think she, she should ever review an actor's shoes. <laughs> That's like Paul That's Simon. That's all I have to say about her. That's like the Mr. Famous reviewer in New York, Mr. Simon, who reviews their physical appearances. You've, you've heard about him. Jackie, uh, you've been around for a long, long time now. Does adverse criticism bother you, or no, do you have a thick skin about that? No, it think? doesn't. Yeah. The only criticism that I value comes directly from an audience. If they're not, and incidentally, a comedian's whole life is... Uh, um, run by immediate criticism. He tells a joke, and if the laugh isn't there, he knows right away he's bombing. Mm -hmm. A dancer has a couple of choruses to dance to to impress an audience. A singer has a couple of choruses to charm a group. Uh, in a play, you have a whole two and a half hours to make your point and to win an audience. But when a comedian walks out on the stage and he says, a funny thing happened, it better be funny mm -hmm. because the audience will tell him right away. It's an immediate criticism. That's why comedy is so tough to do. Mm -hmm. When you look tele at television today and at some of the nightclubs, which you never patronized, or at least not very often, uh, are you a little disappointed in what you're seeing your fellow comedians doing? Well, they're not my uh, fellow comedians. Uh, they take monologists now and put them into, uh, into shows that are storyline shows. And that's an entirely different business. Uh, when, if you're a scene comic, that's entirely different than telling monologues. It's very difficult to do scene comic, storyline comedy. And uh, to take a fellow who's a, a popular monologist and put him into a storyline uh, plot uh, isn't a good idea, and it doesn't work out many times. Uh, as you can see, the shows are going off right and left. Um, Violence has been erased from television, so they had to go to the next thing, sex. If you watch any of the uh, trailers saying, don't forget to watch tonight, so-and-so is going to be on, will she get in bed with George, 
Oh, will George do this to her? It's all sex. They don't say anything about the funny situation you're going to see that the writers wrote. It's just uh, mm -hmm. uh, the easy way out. It's like in burlesque when we'd say to a comic, you're a pants dropper. A guy would drop his pants for a the laugh. The easiest way to get cheap, a laugh. Cheap yeah. shots. Yeah. Jackie, there's a moral to Sly Fox. Instead of, in addition to being great, uh, hilarious, hilarious and, uh, and moving in some regards, but there's a great moral there about the... Uh, Greed. Greed. And the man, Avarice. the man who is easiest to take is the guy who's trying to take you. We had a guy named Yellow Kid Wilder out here, one of the great con artists uh, of all. Yeah, I know. And well, his point was kid. always that the easiest guys to take were the guys who was trying to take me. That's right. If and, you can find a man who is cheap or a cheat, it's a cinch you can make money from him. It's the same thing yeah. in golf. If a guy starts to lie about his handicap, you know, if you've been playing golf, and you just adjust your own handicap. So in the end, he gets screwed. Yeah. That's the point Ben Johnson, who wrote the all poem from which the show was ba on which the show was based, was making way back there in 1600 yes. or something, whenever it was first. To vividly was. show avarice, and the result of avarice, is a, is a moral uh, mm. lesson. Sure. Now, you say the show was written originally for you by Larry Gilbert. Yes, you with me in mind. I wouldn't do it because I didn't want to go to, Chicago, uh, to New York. Uh, I don't like New York anymore. It's a dirty city and it, everyone's running around frightened, and I didn't want to be in that atmosphere. And I told him I didn't want to do it, not even to send the script to me. But after the show had been open for about six months, someone got a script down to me, and I went into my den, and it was lying on my desk. and I picked it up and I started to read it and I knew that this was something I should do. Mm -hmm. Now the tour calls for New York. Are you going to do New York on this tour? I don't know. <clears throat> I don't know. It's a tough show to do, Cup. And, New uh, York used to be your bailiwick. You oh, were the I king of New, New York for a I long New time. York. Uh, gosh, uh, if anybody was a New Yorker, I think I was. You went. were. And I never went to bed before 5 o'clock in the morning, and I'd only go to bed then to find out if the pillows were soft. Uh, I'd be up immediately, take a shower and dress and go to the next place that was open to have fun. And I loved New York, but uh, New York has changed. Toots is gone, of course. And most of the guys that uh, were my friends or colleagues, or guys that we'd sit around telling lies to, are gone. They've all disappeared, uh, and for a guy my age and uh, like me, there is no reason for me to go to New York. Uh, everybody's disappeared. In the great days of New York, Jackie was a regular at a place called Toots Shores. Now, Toots was a huge, <laughs> uh, garrulous, but a very lovable character. He was one of the best saloon keepers in the nation, certainly one of the best known. And one of the great stories involves a foot race between Toots Shore and Jackie Gleason when both were loaded to the gills, had enough to wager a, a bet on who could run around that block faster. Yes. And would you pick the story up from there, Jackie? Because well, uh, it's a great story. We were sitting at a table. Uh, uh, Jimmy Cannon, the sports writer, was there, and Joe DiMaggio, and a couple of the other regulars. And Toots and I got into an argument about uh, who was more athletically uh, uh, inclined. inclined. And I said, Toots, don't talk to me about athletics. I said, you get winded opening clams. So. <laughs> And I, he said, well, let's do something. I said, well, I don't want to fight you, Toots. I like you, and I don't want to hurt you. So we finally decided we'd have a race. So we got out in front of the, and I said, Toots, be, so we won't collect the crowd. You run one way, and I'll run the other. And I said, we'll both come in. Whoever gets in front of the door first wins. He said, OK. And I made sure that I ran down toward 6th Avenue, because I could hop in a cab there, and it was all one way with the <laughs> right cab around. right around the block. And of course, Toots ran around, and I was standing in front of the door with all the guys smoking the cigarettes. He says, all right, all right, you beat me. And then we went inside, and a couple of drinks later, I heard a, a roar, Rah! And he turned around to me, and he says, I didn't pass you. Yes. <laughs> a lot of wonderful things happened in Toots' yours. 
We spent many an hour there, Jackie. Yeah. Jackie, let's go back to your youth now. You lost your mother and you lost your father who disappeared uh, from your life at an early age. Who really reared Jackie Gleason? Who gave you your start in life? Well, uh, my father disappeared when I was seven years old, and then my mother had to go to work. And I was alone a great deal of the time. And uh, because my mother had uh, lost a son earlier, uh, when I was three years old, uh, he died, my brother Clements, and he was 14 at the time. And then with my father just disappearing, she was very protective of me. And uh, I didn't go to school till I was eight years old. Hmm. They had to come and get me uh, and tell her that she had to send me to school. But she taught me to read. I could read before I went to school, but there was one thing wrong with it. She had an Irish accent, and when she taught me to read, a word like think, she pronounced as tink. And that's the way I spoke, and when I got into school, <laughs> uh, I could read, but I read the way she had taught me to pronounce the words, and I was uh, uh, the butt of all of the other kids. And... But I, uh, I think I grew up quite alone. Uh, well, your which, mother died when you were 15. Yeah. Then who, who did you live no with? No one. I no. went right we, after the funeral. We were sitting on the stoop. And I said, well, I guess I'll go. And uh, the Dunahees, who were great family, uh, said, well, stay with us. I said, no. I said, i got to go to work. I had 36 cents, which is a standing start. Mm. And I went to New York, and uh, it cost me a nickel to get there. Then I bought two, I remember it perfectly, I bought, bought two uh, apple and cream cheese waffles that they sold at a thing. That cost the 20 cents or something. Anyway, I was broke without a cent, and for some reason or other, and I still can't understand it, I wasn't uh, apprehensive. And I ran into a friend of mine, Sammy Birch. Uh, he's dead, God rest his soul. And I told him, I said, I have no place to stay, Sammy. He says, well, come on up to my, my place. And when I got there, I found out there were two other guys there. Everybody was staying at the Markwell Hotel. Mm -hmm. And uh, I stayed there, and he called up some agents and, and got me a couple of jobs. And then uh, I took off. But That's when you started as a, in swimming, wasn't it? Well, no, I, 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 was, I, was in a, I was an exhibition swimmer and diver when I was 10 years old, 11 years old. Mm -hmm. And uh, from there, and then I racked balls in a pool room and learned, learned to play how to well. be the hustler. I became a hustler, and I'd make a couple of bucks that way. Um, people say that comedians lead sad lives when they're kids. That might be so, but I never realized that I was le leading a sad mm -hmm. life. Everyone around the neighborhood was broke. So I thought I was the same as ever. I thought that's how you live. You were broke. Everybody's broke. And my mother uh, was such a wonderful woman and gave me so much love that uh, I didn't miss anything there, even though my father had left. Your mother was a very unusual lady. I remember you telling me once that she worked in the wintertime. She has a strap cardboard around her legs to keep uh, them No, warm. it wasn't cardboard. Or paper. Uh, or that's something. the day, uh, what you're speaking of, is the day that I decided to be a good boy. She was getting dressed to go to work about 6 o'clock in the morning, and I had b belonged to the Catholic Boys Brigade, and we had uniforms with leggings. And, mm -hmm. and I saw her wrapping the leggings around her leg yeah. and putting her stockings over, because she had to walk five blocks through the snow to get the... Uh, train to take her to work. She was a, a change maker on the subway. Uh -huh. And I watched her doing this. And a bell went off or whatever. But I knew from that moment on that I had to do everything this woman asked me and to give her all the love I could possibly give her because she was doing something for me that was unheard of yeah. as far as I was concerned. Beautiful story. Jackie, in your press interview the other day, they asked you some questions about some of your fellow entertainers, and I thought you handled it beautifully at the spur of the moment with your conversation. Do you mind if I throw these names out and Not get your reaction? Not at all. I thought the one you paid the greatest tribute to was Art Carney, who co-starred, I will use the word advisedly, on The Honeymooners with you. Well, if Art I Carney. spoke any other way of Art Carney except complimentary, I, I'd be a, a liar and a very deceitful man. Art Carney... Uh, working with Art Carney, 
was the greatest experience I've ever had in my life. He is the greatest comic sensitive I've ever met. And I have said it before and I say it again, he's uh, uh, responsible for 75% of my success on television. He is a great actor, as now the world knows, yeah. since he got the Academy Award. And on top of that, a great comic. I don't know of anybody who is as good in what he does as Art Connie. Art Connie is the top. Barbara Streisand. Well, as I said to you, you know, I said she looks like midnight, but she sings like early morning. Yeah. And she does. Yeah. Uh, she's a great singer. Uh, years ago, uh, when uh, Merv Griffin had a show, I said, I heard a dame sing the other night. I said, she doesn't look too good. And this was before she had a nose fixed. Did you know she had a nose fixed? <laughs> Well, she did. Must be anyway. the same one who did mine. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, anyway, I should uh, put her on, and he got her on, and she was a riot. She sang like an angel. She has one of the, an extraordinary range of voice, and great phrasing and feeling, and uh, she's just wonderful. I think she's the best singer around. Now you paid a similar com compliment, but not quite as lavish, for Martha Ray, with whom you have appeared. Martha Ray, and I know if she hears me say this, uh, she won't take offense. She's a hoodlum. Huh? She's a great dame to be around. She's just as much at home with the guys as she is with the girls. She's a brother, she's a sister, she's a mother. She had a voice that was tantalizingly uh, romantic with that hoarseness mm -hmm. and, and to see that voice coming out of that large mouth but realizing the heart that was behind it. She was a wonderful day. Mm -hmm. Still is. And a great comedian. Yes, she is. How about Humphrey Bogart? Now, you worked with him. Yes, uh, Humphrey Bogart. I think I'm He was the your only... match, wasn't he, when it came to drinking? Uh, uh, more than my more match. Than your uh, he would get loaded on one drink and then stay that way. Never got any more loaded, but he would be stiff after the first drink. Yeah. And I think I'm the only actor that he ever paid uh, for lunch. Uh, we were making this picture all through the night, and he said to me, Hey, uh, let's go over to uh, Lakeside and have lunch. And I went with him, and he picked up the tab, and we both started to drink pretty good over there and he came back and I said Jesus I said I don't think that uh, you should work bogey he says I'm not going to and he put on one of his great gloves that he wore in the picture and said it was too tight uh -huh. and they called Warner Warner come over and laughing you know <laughs> because bogey was a big star and they didn't want to aggravate him and bogey says until you get a glove that fits I'm going home and that's the excuse he used, and we walked out of the, the sound stage and <laughs> went on to Romanoff's and <laughs> continued. He was a great practical joker on top of oh, everything. Oh, he was beautiful. And Peter Lorre, who was our buddy then, was just as exquisite. Yeah. He, uh, what a nice guy to hang around Peter was with. a wonderful guy. Yeah. No meanness, yeah. no evil in him, just a nice yeah. guy. Jackie, you've had almost every success you can think of in the show business world. Now you live almost in retirement. You come out once in a while. You do honeymooners once in a while. You do the sly foxes once in a while. But basically, you live down in Florida, a man of retirement, play golf all the time. Is life uh, satisfactory for you that way? Is that oh, what it, it's uh, beautiful. And especially, uh, as you know, Cup, uh, I went with my present wife, uh, Marilyn, 25 years ago. And I couldn't get a divorce. And we sat down and talked it over and decided to call it off. And she went on and married a very lovely man from everything I hear. From had Chicago, a, by the way. Yes. And had a, a child uh, who was a joy. And unfortunately, her husband died. And she moved to Florida to be near her sister, June. And I found out she was there, and I called her up, and we went to dinner. And, I threw some charm on her, hmm. and she probably threw a little on me, and we got married. And, That's a uh, great story in itself. And it is the best thing that ever happened to me in my life. That's beautiful. Just gorgeous. Now, you do play some golf down there. You have I your have my pigeons. I have, for instance, I have a golf annuity named Bob Hope. Bob Hope. 
he shows up and just shells it out all the time. Yeah. Somebody asked me uh, what my automobile cost, and I said, I don't know. Hope paid for it. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a picture that showed uh, one of your golf tournaments in which uh, I participated, mm -hmm. and a president named Mr. Nixon showed up there as your uh, guest. Yeah. And if you look carefully, you can see Jackie talking to the president. Behind him is uh, your host of the show yes, here. Yes, Cup. That yeah. was a... Uh, you were doing the FBI bit that day. Yeah. With the dark glasses. And, <laughs> and with an FBI agent, by the way. Who yes, was yes, right behind him. There. Yeah. Jackie, uh, you often have said that uh, television has lost its glamour for you. It's too hard work going back and doing a weekly series, which I it know is, you've had many It is, because I offers. won't do television the way they're doing it today. Well, I, even when we do our specials, we do it in front of an audience. And if it's an hour show, it runs about an hour and 15 minutes. And the 15 minutes is for scenery changes. We do it exactly as if we were doing a play in a theater. No stops. We use no teleprompters, no idiot cards. And um, doing a show like that is very difficult. And to think you could do it every week. When I was younger, you know, you stay out till 9 in the morning and learn your script between then and 12 o'clock noon. But you can't do it uh, when you get on into later life. And, and also, you have to live with a, a television show if you have any interest in it. The script is always in your mind. And you'd finish a show on Saturday night, Monday you meet the writers and it starts over again. And then if this, the script is 60 sides long, which is 60 pages. And you have to learn that in uh, three or four days. I never had any difficult learning it uh, difficulty learning it because uh, I have a very good memory. I have a photographic uh, memory. And, uh, but still, it would linger in the back of your mind. You knew you had to do it again Saturday night. And a terrible pressure. A lot of guys uh, couldn't stand the pressure. And look at uh, Prince and, and yeah. those guys. and. Uh, yeah. yeah. They all complain about how difficult it is, even when they're young people. That's Jackie, right. you talk about the script. Now, the story in show business is that you have the best retentive memory in the business. You pick up a script once and you read it and you know it. Now, is it that good? You can read it once and you know the yes. script? Yes. That's remarkable. Now, that... Well, I think I that was from, that. Uh, from the fact I told you that I was alone when I was a child, uh, quite often. And I would ask my mother to buy me a book, Tarzan or Bomba the Jungle Boy or Nick Carter or something. And it was my only entertainment. And I was so anxious to read the book that I rushed through it to get to the end. And when I tell my mother, well, I finished the book, she says, you couldn't have finished the book. You got it 20 minutes ago. I said, I did. And she'd open it up. She says, all right, what is Nick Carter doing on page? He just met so-and-so. And I said, well, he did. remember. And uh, for some reason or other, my memory began to strengthen uh, from those kind of experiences. Uh, a strange thing happens with photographic memory. When you have no urge to use it, you lose it. And uh, although I can look at a script now and, and memorize it very quickly, I could do it a hell of a lot faster years ago. Jack, we were running out of time, but before we do, I'd like to pay a compliment to two of the people in your show who I think are superb. Uh, Cleavon Little. Oh, sensational. Just wonderful. And, of course, Irwin Corey. Oh, he's great. But I thought that guy who played the chief of police with all the sex hang-ups was yes. just wonderful. What oh, yes. Great yeah. He delivers his lines yeah. right on the button. Yeah. He has a great delivery. Yeah. He has a small part, and I'm, I'm thankful that you, you bring up that you remember him, because everybody does this. He's the show. They remember that guy because even though he has a small part, he does it so well Very they good. remember him. Well, we've run out of time with Jackie Gleason now. We want to thank him. Jackie Gleason will be at the Blackstone Theater in the Sly Fox, and he's a sly one, believe me. We're going to be joined in a few moments by Carl Sagan, the prize-winning author of Dragons of Eden, Tom Wicker of the New York Times, and Ben Wattenberg, a political scientist. Incidentally, I know you're a great fave fan of Carl Sagan, so oh, yes. if you feel like coming back and joining us a little bit later, we'd appreciate it. I'd be delighted. Very good. We'll take a pause here for just a moment and bring on our three new guests. <laughs>